Welcome to ARU and uh, English Fest. Um, so my name's uh, Sarah Jones. Um, my role at ARU is to hopefully match the right students with the right courses. Um, and I'd like to introduce um, Professor Sarah Brown, who's here with us today, who's going to be talking about dystopia, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. Um, Sarah's Sarah is Professor of English Literature at ARU and she teaches courses on the influence of myth and fairy tale on English literature, science fiction and the European novel, which is really interesting. Um, she's Secretary of the Science Fiction Foundation and has just completed a book on Shakespeare's influence on science fiction for Liverpool University Press, which sounds fascinating. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Sarah. Um, I've mentioned that we're recording this session and that we'll come to Q&A at the end. But if you do have any questions, if there's, if there's anything that strikes you as we're going along, please do put it in the chat and then I'll just kind of flag it to Sarah at the end as we get to the questions and answers. Um, at the end, I will also put um, a little feedback form in the chat. I would be really grateful if you could just take a couple of minutes um, to complete that. Um, we'll also send a QR code for those of you who are joining us from classrooms um, just to help facilitate doing that with your students because um, we'd really appreciate your feedback so it helps us know what went well and what we can do better because we'd like to continue to run these. Um, so at this point I will unmic and I'll hand over to Sarah who will be leading our session today on Margaret Atwood, The Handmaid's Tale uh, and we hope you enjoy. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to now try to share my screen. Sometimes it just takes a minute to locate the right presentation. So hopefully you can see that image. Sarah, do shout, of course, if yeah, no, that's all fine. Sarah, thank seem you. Right. Great. Um, so this is just one of the many covers. Um, some quite similar to one another that have been used for The Handmaid's Tale. And I'm going to be returning to another cover towards the end of the presentation. First of all, just a really brief overview. I'm going to offer a few thoughts on dystopian fiction generally, some of its characteristic themes and motifs. And then, of course, move on to Atwood and The Handmaid's Tale in particular and those are um, the key points I want to focus on in that part of the lecture so environmentalism, feminism, religion, surveillance and race. I thought it'd be useful to offer you a couple of quotations taken from the science fiction encyclopedia's definition of dystopian science fiction. It's a really useful online resource, which I often turn to. So I'll just read out these two. They're not definitions, but they're sentences. They're statements that sort of move towards a definition and are helpful. The word dystopia denotes that class of hypothetical societies containing images of worlds worse than our own. And that's almost a little bit too broad to work as a definition and I'm going to return to that point later and I think this is really helpful. Dystopian images are almost invariably images of future society pointing fearfully at the way the world is supposedly going in order to provide urgent propaganda for a change in direction and I think that's really true and really helpful that very many science fiction dystopias um, are preoccupied with things that seem to be beginning to go in the wrong direction and showing how um, society would be so much worse if they took hold and got you know, more powerful, more exaggerated. Um, so in that way, they are indeed a kind of propaganda encouraging us, encouraging governments to try and do things better. And I'm just going to pause briefly here to invite you to think of any other works of dystopian fiction you might have encountered. And these don't have to be literary. They might be from TV or film. And I've just put one example here, which is The Hunger Games, the uh, first part 
Mockingjay, which is a, a really good, a really powerful dystopian fiction, both as a book and as a film. In fact, I teach it on my science fiction module here at ARU. So I'm just going to, before um, thinking about a few examples of dystopian fiction, just um, briefly bring in a point about another subgenre of science fiction, which is in some ways quite similar to dystopian fiction. And this is post-apocalyptic fiction. And one reason I thought it'd be quite useful to mention it here is because the boundaries between post-apocalyptic fiction and dystopian fiction are quite fuzzy. So if we think again about that sentence about dystopia that I showed you a few slides ago, the word dystopia denotes that class of hypothetical societies containing images of worlds worse than our own. That's also totally true of post-apocalyptic fiction. So I thought it'd be helpful just to pause and briefly tease out the differences between the two. They're not absolute. There's not a, um, a really kind of firm line between the two. Sometimes it's difficult to know which subgenre to put a novel or film into. But essentially, um, in post-apocalyptic fiction or film, and the picture here is of the film of The Road, a novel by Cormac McCarthy. In post-apocalyptic fiction, you have um, generally the aftermath of some absolutely overwhelming disaster. And I guess the classic example might be a nuclear war or a completely killer plague. I've put those examples on the slide. But one interesting distinction, I think, between post-apocalyptic science fiction and dystopian fiction is that whereas post-apocalyptic fiction shows generally a complete breakdown, things have utterly fallen apart, quite often in dystopian futures, um, the world, the society we're introduced to is actually more regimented, more ordered than the present world. So I thought that's not maybe a hard and fast rule, but it's that's quite a useful um, benchmark to consider if you're trying to work out whether something is a post-apocalyptic or a dystopian fiction. So here are a few examples of different dystopian fictions and they fit in with what I was just saying about how dystopian science fiction generally um, offers us a society which is in some ways more ordered because one way in which many dystopian fictions choose to imagine their future is to present us with a world, a society where people are divided into very sharply differentiated groups or castes. So I'll just briefly say something about these examples. They're all quite well known, but very different from one another. Brave New World presents um, a future where everyone is cloned. You don't have families anymore and people are deliberately bred to be at a particular level of intelligence and ability. So the most intelligent are called alphas, whereas the less intelligent are called beta or gamma from the letters of the Greek alphabet. And 1984, it's not quite as regimented, but you have an inner party where you know the, the elite um, officials um, are, are situated. Then you get the outer party, the ordinary office workers, and then you get um, what are called um, in the novel, the proles, rather um, derisory term for the working class characters who are actually less controlled than all the other characters. In Divergent, which is a more recent one, you may, you may know through the film or the novel, um, people are divided into groups according to their personality, which is a, an interesting variation on the theme. And in The Hunger Games, again, a slightly different sort of pattern, but people are divided into different districts who specialise in different industries broadly. And here is a picture from a 1980 film version of Brave New World and of course the recent um, Handmaid's Tale, I was going to say Hunger Games there, recent Handmaid's Tale uh, series which show you how colours are used to differentiate between the castes 
the groups. I said earlier that one um, function of dystopian fiction is to act as a warning and a really clear way in which this can be done is to take trends in modern society and make them stronger, make them more emphatic, make them more literal. So in the book that there's a slightly fuzzy picture of here, um, Robert Swindle's Daz for Zoe, you have um, a social class structure which is not dissimilar from Britain today or indeed in the, the 90s, which is, which is I think when this book was written, but it's much, much more exaggerated. And um, the different classes, the different social classes are divided by physical barriers. Here you can see a representation of a wire fence which separates middle class uh, Zoe from her boyfriend, Daz, who's from the working classes and is much less privileged, of course. And as I put on the slide here, it's really common to get um, representations of a dystopian future where people who are um, underprivileged today have lost even more privileges. So they, for example, are unable to vote. That's quite a common motif in dystopian science fiction. But one thing that's quite interesting about The Handmaid's Tale is that it doesn't follow that pattern. And in a sense, perhaps that's part of what makes it so unsettling, both for the reader and, of course, for Offred, the heroine, that her um, background was quite comfortable, quite secure. She was a middle class professional, doing well, happy in her family life. And then suddenly everything changed and partly because of her, her sex, because she's a woman, and also partly because of her um, relationship, which wasn't approved of by the new society of Gilead she loses caste, she loses um, status dramatically and is not at the very bottom of the pile, but she's much, much, much less um, privileged than she was. So this is a reminder of that second helpful sentence from the science fiction encyclopedia article. And I want to pause at this point and invite you to take take a minute or so and do feel free to put things in the chat if you'd like to. So take a minute just to think about what kinds of fears, what anxieties, what maybe topical um, crises might have inspired writers of dystopian fiction in the 20th century, say in the 30s and 40s, what do you think people were afraid of then? What do you think they might have been afraid of in the later 20th century or today? So what are the themes that are driving or have driven dystopian science fiction over the last several decades? So as I said, I've just paused to give you time to think about that. Here are some examples. It's definitely um, not an exhaustive list, but what I was doing was trying to think both about some typical mid 20th century worries that made themselves manifest in dystopian science fiction and also about more recent concerns. And it's interesting to think about, for example, which science fiction writers were prescient. In other words, which science fiction writers foretold what the worries of say the 20th century might be even though they are writing in the in the in the in earlier decades so just going through this list quickly the first one i came up with was an anxiety around the soviet union um so russia as was for the 20th century much of the 20th century and uh, very strongly associated with that of course is an anxiety about communism the political system of the Soviet Union. And that's one of the worries which lies behind George Orwell's 1984, because although George Orwell was a left-wing writer, 
he was very opposed to what he saw as the Soviet Union's extremely authoritarian form of government, the way it was really clamping down on freedom. Somewhat at the other end of the spectrum are dystopian fictions which demonstrate an anxiety about capitalism or um, what's sometimes called neoliberalism, the idea that all the checks and balances which make sure there's a safety net for the very poorest are perhaps thrown out the window, environmental um, regulations are also ditched and everything is just left up, up to big business. So that's an example of a kind of dystopia which is not um, fitting into what I said earlier about um, dystopian fiction often showing a more regimented society because things have in some ways got um, less regimented but not in a good way. Fears about Nazism of course would be another strong um, 20th century anxiety and a slightly less obvious one is a fear that culture might become less refined. I put here that it might become dumbed down. So a famous example of that kind of dystopia is Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, which presents a future where reading is outlawed. And you get people going from house to house, taking people's books and burning them because they're seen as dangerous. You have to watch television all day instead. That's a little bit like Brave New World, Huxley's Brave New World. And fears about machines and technology, fears that they're going to dehumanise humanity, as it were, and stop us appreciating nature. One story I really like doing with uh, my undergraduates is by E.M. Forster, who wrote generally n novels about sort of upper middle class society in the beginning of the 20th century. But he wrote this fascinating story called The Machine Stops, which seems like um, a, a kind of prophecy of, of things like Facebook and Twitter. So do look that up. You can read it online. It's really interesting. It's quite a long, short story, but very, very absorbing. So I've already mentioned in, in the overview slide some of the key motifs and thus that the key fears which are really important for The Handmaid's Tale. So I just let you have a quick look at this slide, just pause briefly while you remind yourselves what I thought those were. And you might like to think whether you feel I've, I've missed any out, do put them in the chat if, if that's the case. One thing I'm not really covering in this lecture, even though it's really important for The Handmaid's Tale, is reproductive rights. There's just so much to, to cover, but of course do ask about that in the Q&A if you'd like to. So I'll be saying a little bit about all of these themes now. I'm going to start with the environment. Now this is a really good indicator of how those boundaries between dystopian fiction and post-apocalyptic fiction can become quite blurred because in fact an anxiety about a future environmental crisis um, which really hits fertility rates could be seen as more typical of post-apocalyptic fiction but on the whole I think The Handmaid's Tale fits in better with um, the characteristics of dystopian science fiction. And as I've noted here, although you could argue that the environment is incredibly important as a theme in The Handmaid's Tale, my sense, I, I reread it quickly, having not taught it for a little while, but, but my sense um, is that Offred herself is more concerned about what's happening to women, really, and to the, to rel the religious theme rather than the environmental anxieties. And the picture here is of a really good novel, another one I, I, I teach on uh, my science fiction module by Octavia Butler called The Parable of the Sower, which is um, from, I think, 1997. And in some ways, it's one of those ones which seems quite prophetic because although people were worried about the environment, then there's, there's an intensity in her depiction of climate change, which you don't tend to get until rather later, until the 21st century in science fiction. One thing I find really interesting about science fiction is how you can go back to earlier decades 
and remind yourself what people were worried about in, say, the 1930s or the 1970s. So there's a 1960s novel, I think, by John Christopher, which is all about an ice age hitting the world. And even when I was at school in the 1970s and 80s, that was still a thing. People weren't so aware of global warming. They were worried about a second ice age instead. I wanted to, to make a point here, but also just and offer a cautionary note that this is a point which is only relevant to the TV series, I think, or certainly much more strongly relevant in the context of the TV series. Um, this is particularly if you're studying the novel formally, I need to answer essays about it. Um, so in the TV series, I thought it was really interesting that we learned that Gilead has apparently taken lots of measures to reduce harm to the environment such as cutting carbon emissions and plastic packaging and I think for many readers and or viewers rather that's going to seem like a very very positive step but of course there are all sorts of other things going on in Gilead that we don't like at all so as I said here it's a tension it's an irony and it's not perhaps really present in Atwood's original novel but there's another rather similar irony or tension in the novel, which I'm going to move on to now in relation to the theme of feminism. So as I noted at the beginning, I can't um, say an awful lot about um, reproductive rights here just because of time, but do come back to it in the Q&A. But I expect if you're studying the novel, you've already thought about the really poignant irony in the strange convergence that you wouldn't really expect between feminism or some versions of feminism and the new laws of Gilead, this theocracy, this very religious regime. And I put a quote here which you may well um, be familiar with, but just to remind you if not, this is from a flashback when Offred's remembering something she saw in her youth um, when her mother who was a very active feminist, was very involved in trying to ban pornography. There were some men too among the women and the books were magazines. They must have poured gasoline because the flames shot high and then they began dumping the magazines from boxes, not too many at a time. Some of them were chanting, onlookers gathered, their faces were happy, ecstatic almost. And I think I've always been aware of this interesting irony in the novel, but I'd somehow missed until I was just rereading it, the similarity with this scene, which is set in within the Gilead regime itself. And in some ways it's superficially similar because what's being um, burnt are the sort of sexy burlesque clothes, um, which are associated with female sexuality. So there's a little bit of a link with burning pornography. Again, I'll just read it quickly. All such clothing was supposed to have been destroyed. I remember seeing it on television in news clips filmed in one city after another. In New York, it was called the Manhattan Cleanup. There were bonfires in Times Square, crowds chanting around them, women throwing their arms up thankfully into the air when they felt the cameras on them, clean cut, stony faced young men tossing things onto the flames armfuls of silk and nylon and fake fur. So, as I said, an interesting mixture of, of a kind of parallelism and contrast. So, for example, in this scene, it's far more men on the whole who are doing the actual burning and the women are only throwing their arms out, arms up in the air, as it says here, when they felt the cameras on them. So they're only performing, they're faking being pleased with what's going on. I was talking to my sister who teaches A-level English um, in schools and she said that a lot of students at the moment were studying Atwood alongside Frankenstein. So in case that's relevant to your study, to the, the board that you're sitting, I thought I'd mention a possible brief parallel with Frankenstein. So in Mary Shelley's early 19th century novel, the uh, scientist Frankenstein spends ages working on his goal, 
and I expect even if you're not studying the novel, you perhaps know a little bit about it. His goal is to create a new artificial form of life. And he spends so long researching this, but then as soon as it's succeeded, as soon as he's made this creature come to life, and there's an early illustration of that scene here, he's really shocked, he's horrified, he leaves the room. And that dynamic reminded me of um, the, the uh, effect created by The Handmaid's Tale of wanting pornography perhaps to be banned and restricted, and then having your wish granted, but not at all in, in the right way, in the way you'd hope for. And I think it's really interesting to think about the way in which The Handmaid's Tale has been co-opted more recently for the Me Too movement. So um, I expect you, you are aware of this, but this is a movement against sexual harassment of women. And the handmade costume has been used by protesters who are standing up for women's rights um, not to be harassed and abused in this way. And there's yet another, I think, layer of irony in, in the way Atwood herself has been caught up in this controversy, in this social justice phenomenon, as I'll show you on the next slide. Um, sorry, this is a slightly dense slide, but it is interesting. And if anyone wants the slides, I'm very um, happy to, to send them over, by the way, and the reference is there, the link is there at the bottom. This is a Guardian article, and it's describing how Atwood is actually quite ambivalent towards contemporary feminism. And what I thought was really interesting about this quotation from Atwood in the, the, the middle of the passage, that second bullet point, is how when describing um, feminist movements, she uses the language of religious zealotry. I'll just read that section out. So Atwood raised the possibility that the answer could leave women divided. In times of extremes, extremists win. Their ideology becomes a religion. Anyone who doesn't puppet their views is seen as an apostate. That means someone who leaves their religion, a heretic, another very religiously loaded word, or a traitor. And moderates in the middle are annihilated. And as it explains at the bottom of the slide, one thing she got into a bit of trouble for with some people was signing an open letter expressing concern that a, a male professor facing allegations of sexual misconduct was in danger of not receiving due process, of not being treated in a just fashion. And I'm just going to check the time to make sure I'm not overrunning. And that would just give you a moment to catch up with the slide if you haven't, haven't had the opportunity to read it. Clearly, one of the anxieties on Atwood's mind when she was writing her novel was the religious right. So that was, has been for some time quite a strong force in the United States, more so than here. And I was very aware of it when I was a teenager in the 1980s. And in some ways, it's had a bit of a growth recently, though taking some different directions. And what I've put here, just to give you a flavour of the religious right in America, is two little um, bullet points, one of which reflects a soft end of the religious right, not so extreme, the other, the more extreme elements. So Phyllis Shafley, um, a, a sort of anti-feminist activist in the 70s, said, what I'm defending is the real rights of women. A woman should have the right to be in the home as a wife and mother. And the next um, little quotation is from an, an interview about, as I said, more, a more extreme version of the religious right. In the early 1990s, there was a backlash in the most conservative wing of an evangelical fundamentalism. The Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood put out Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood by Grudem and Piper. That book argued that women were to be in submission to men, not just in marriage and the family, but in every aspect of society. They said it was unbiblical for women to be in positions of authority in the work world where they had authority over men. So Phyllis Shafley 
isn't arguing that the law should be changed to stop women going to work or having senior roles. She's making a much softer point than that. But some people in the United States favour a position much closer to that of Gilead, which is theocratic. In other words, the government is incredibly strongly um, controlled by a very hardline view of religion. So I thought that that was quite an interesting little bit of context to show that there were some some movements, some individuals in in United States at that time who would actually perhaps have quite favoured Gilead. But of course, they were a minority. And just as, as a contrast, as a reminder, in other parts of the world, the kinds of fears that Gilead um, acts out, represents, really was a lived reality, not just a kind of background noise from a few minority voices. So you might just like to think, don't worry if you have no idea, um, where and when this photograph might have been taken. So it's from Iran, and in 1979, there was a revolution, as you may be aware, which overturned the government and replaced it with a theocratic regime. Um, of course, Muslim, not Christian, like Gilead. And the image on the right is from a really good graphic novel by, I'm not sure if I've got the pronunciation right, but Marjane Satrapi, Persepolis. And it shows... Um, figures a little bit like the aunts in Gilead called guardians of the revolution. So women who went around checking that other women were dressed appropriately. I'm going to go reasonably quickly over these slides because I don't want to overrun. I've got one more topic I want to cover after this one. But I think the theme of surveillance is very interesting in Atwood and it's so important in dystopian fiction generally. So. Some of the themes may change. For example, as I said, Orwell was particularly worried about communism and, and the sort of Soviet style of government, but he was really worried about surveillance as well. And then you might get in a much more modern dystopian fiction, parallel worries, but with you know a different uh, political backdrop. Because in today's world, there are all sorts of entirely real anxieties about surveillance getting out of hand sometimes leading to genuine sort of tensions and problems. It, it isn't all bad. So some people will feel safer because of things like closed circuit TV. It can help you work out who's committed a crime. So it's not just negative, but it is potentially quite sinister. And there's, there are lots of anxieties about a broader um, problem of personal information being captured, perhaps being sold to businesses who use it in ways we might not want it to be used, Siri recordings, and, and particularly, I think in recent years, quite a lot of worry focused on China. For example, I read um, a concerning story recently about emotion detective software being tested on the Uyghur Muslim minority who are being so, so persecuted at the moment. And just briefly, I won't, I won't read these out, but I thought it was really interesting how, as I was rereading Handmaid's Tale, I was struck by the relationship between Off Red and the woman who becomes her friend, Off Glen. She doesn't know she can trust her at first. And as they're beginning to get to know each other, they have to find quiet places, free from microphones. And they misunderstood each other at first because they were both putting in an act, being really um, pious, being really loyal to the regime. Um, they, they couldn't trust each other to begin with. And you get just the same things going on in 1984 with Widston and his lover, Julia. They've also got to avoid those microphones, go into the country. And they, um, Winston thought Julia was a real party loyalist at first, which she's not at all. So the final topic I want to just spend a few minutes on is race. And I, I wouldn't say this is the issue which first springs to mind when considering which topics are important for The Handmaid's Tale. So as I've indicated, you might think about, of course, feminism and reproduction and surveillance um, and the environment. But it, it is interesting, and perhaps partly because it's not 
obvious. It's interesting just to probe at the novel and the TV series a little and think about this. Um, now, I don't know if you've seen the TV series and it does treat this theme differently because both Offred's um, husband and her friend Moira and then of course also her daughter are, um, I mean Offred's daughter, are black. So that is significant. It does change, you know, the, the dynamic rather. But I want to offer a few thoughts which point to, uh, you know, some concerns, a bit of scepticism about the way race is treated in both the novel and the TV series. So you may remember from the book that it seems it's only looked at glancingly, but it seems as though um, all non-white people are being exported to colonies. And this is quite a sharp judgment on that um, element here from a writer called Noah Balatsky. Gilead obligingly moves black people away so the novel can present black people's experiences without black characters. Atwood critiques the regime, but also collaborates with it to push black people aside. I'm sure, of course, that wasn't at all her intention, whether or not we think that's true in, in part. But one thing that's um, sometimes said about the novel is that it does um, use a lot of motifs from 19th century slavery in America, in the United States, but without black people. So here are some links between handmaids and slaves. They are, of course, treated as commodities. They're dehumanized. They're branded. They try to escape to Canada. That was exactly where so many US slaves try to escape to. And the network on helping them is called the Underground Female Road, which echoes the Underground Railroad, which helped slaves in the 19th century, a network of people collaborating to get them to safety. And it occurred to me, and I was rereading the book, and I had this, this somewhat old edition, and it occurred to me that it was quite odd that the figure here seems to be black, although you could argue that that's just because it's a silhouette against a light background. So the figure has to be black, even though the character is white. And just a couple more kind of visual thoughts, as it were, here. Um, it is common. It is a common um, convention to have black silhouettes. So here are a couple of examples. It was particularly common in 18th, 19th century, sort of Jane Austen times, to have totally black um, silhouette portraits. But I couldn't help thinking about it, and I realised I was slightly reminded by this cover on the left of a famous anti-slavery medal, which you can see on the right, that the writing says, am I not a man and a brother? And I thought the handmade stance is quite similar and that there's a kind of anti-pollution toxic warning sign there, those three circles, which made me think about the chains. It's like a, um, another version of the chain, which you get in the picture on the right, the slave's chain. And I just found that slightly troubling. It fitted in with those critics who say that The Handmaid's Tale presents black experiences from history, but without black characters. And just very quickly, so a couple more slides. Um, some people have felt that even though black actors get good roles in um, the television Handmaid's Tale, there's still something not quite authentic in, in the way they present those roles. So I'll just perhaps read out the second one. We know the depth of Moira's friendship with June before the Gilead takeover. June is off red, but she has denied a connection to black family or black culture. That women of colour still only exist in this televised world via their proximity to white women, even after two seasons of valid critique, feels like a testament to a very white writer's room. And it did occur to me when I was watching the series that it would be an interesting just to keep that racism of Gilead, which seems quite probable, quite plausible, but spend half the time with those black characters who've been sent somewhere else. That would have been taking us away from the original story more, but perhaps in a good way. So finally, if you're interested in exploring um, the genre further, I'd like to recommend a novel, which is also a TV series, though I haven't seen the TV series yet, 
which explores US race relations within a dystopian setting and is completely about, about a, a black experience. And this is the Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, which I've been teaching for a few years now um, and think is absolutely brilliant. In some ways, it's not strictly dystopian. That that word doesn't quite contain it. It's more sort of magic realist, but it's absolutely excellent novel. And that is the end of my presentation. I think I ought to pause there because I think people might have to capture that image. But I will let Sarah explain and tell me when I just stop sharing my screen. Yes, thank you, Sarah. So um, for those of you who would like to um, complete the form, it might be easier if the students use the QR code because then they can just scan that directly from the screen. Um, but I will also pop the um, links to the feedback form in the chat as well, if that's an easier way of doing it, just as we conclude the session. Um, so thank you, Sarah. That was really interesting um, and took us on quite a journey. I like the way that you opened up doors to other ideas and other things that people can explore around the same kind of topics. Um, if you would like to pop any questions in the chat for Sarah, now would be the time to do that. You can ask her anything at all about The Handmaid's Tale, about, um, you know, dystopia in general, the genre of science fiction of which she is an undoubted expert, um, anything about studying those subjects at university. Um, indeed, if you were interested in finding out a bit more about the study of English literature and how specific genres might be explored within the courses, that would be a question you could ask too. Um, I'm going to ask a very basic question, Sarah, if I may, which is um, what do you think of the TV programme and do you think it represents the book and do you think that televised fiction needs to represent the original novel? Um, perhaps beginning with the last bit of the question, because I find that a very easy one. No, not at all. I love it when sometimes I seem to uncover almost a subconscious of the original novel, if you can almost personify a text in that way. And so I think, oh, you know, that's not at all what the novel was perhaps saying, but that, but somehow it captures um, the experience of reading it or one aspect of it. But with A Hammett's Tale, I think in some ways it is pretty true to the spirit of the original. I really enjoy it, by the way, despite sharing, sharing those misgivings about the casting in, in some ways. Um, but I, I, I love the way in which it shows us more of the world. I'd like to see even more of, of that of that world. And in fact, I was at a little conference at the, at the weekend um, and there was a paper about world building. So that process of creating a completely different setting and making it real, giving it texture. And the speaker made a really good, good point I hadn't thought about before, which is that increasingly what audiences and um, people commissioning TV shows want is that sense of a fully imagined world and that's almost as important as the story and, and the characters and when I read a really immersive science fiction book like The Handmaid's Tale I'm always disappointed when I get to the end because so I want to I want it to be almost like a com computer game so that I can go and explore different parts of that world that I wasn't shown there you go. There's a tip there for any of you uh, budding writers out there who um, want to end up getting your novels filmed in some way. A, a fully imagined world is perhaps the key there. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, do do ask any questions that you might have for Sarah. That would be great. Um, I don't know if you saw Sarah, but I popped some of your book recommendations into the chat there um, and also the link to the um, article that you shared as well. So if there are any more recommendations that you could think of, I could pop those in. Uh, there's a question. Oh, Hilary, great minds think alike. Yes, um, Hilary's just said that they would be interested in some follow up reading recommendations. Um, so if there's any reading recommendations that spring to mind now, Sarah, that we could pop in the chat that you might want to talk about a little bit. Yeah. Or otherwise, perhaps we could, um, when I share the link to the recording afterwards, perhaps I could share some further recommended reading. Um, I'll put in the chat quickly a writer called Burdekin. Swastika Night. Quite, quite a difficult read for more than one reason, but it was written in the early 1930s, so before the Second World War even started. But it imagines a future where the Nazis win, and it's very much about feminism, reproductive rights, 
So that might be of interest. And what's really interesting is that whereas there are lots of books about Hitler winning the war, but they're all alternate history because by the time they were written, we knew that hadn't happened. But this represented a genuine fear. Now, there's one and I can never remember the name of the author for some reason, but it's called Jesse Lamb, the Testament of Jesse Lamb. So I don't immediately have the, the details to, to hand, but um, do feel free to email me if you if you want um, further details. Were there any? Um... There's a question here from Claire. Yes. I'll read that out for the, the benefit of the recording. Um, do dystopian works change the status quo? Are there examples of changes in the status quo based on dystopian novels? That's an interesting question. That's a really interesting question. And unfortunately, all the examples that come into my head are examples of dystopian fiction where I can I can see the, the warnings, I can analyse the warnings and I can say, no, no, I don't think they did change things. Although I don't know, because say, think about the use of tele screens for surveillance in 1984, mm. perhaps because they were so sinister in that book, that book, perhaps that helps fuel a particular anxiety about about surveillance today. And I'm sure after this session is finished, I'll think of some really good example and I'll, I'll kick myself. I can't offhand think of a of, of something which really fits, answers that that question in a positive way way. I don't know if anyone else can. Um. I mean, I think it's quite interesting that in some ways we, we, we don't know what the impact of these novels continues to be. And in terms of, you know, over concerns about the use of data, you know, obviously there are many factors, but we don't know that, you know, someone might not read, you know, something like 1984 or Brave New World and suddenly start thinking about surveillance in a, in a different way. Um, it's you know it, it's an interesting idea definitely. I imagine another area might be say cloning so I think lots of people found the cloning in um, Brave New World published not far off 100 years ago now I think about 88 years ago something like that um, but perhaps that similarly like with the surveillance and telescreens in 1984 helped instill an anxiety about cloning um, because it's presented as something you know, quite dangerous, quite negative. And I'm just trying to think of any other reading recommendations because I do I do really like dystopian fiction. So I'm just trying to think what else is a really good one. I've already mentioned Fahrenheit 451. Um, Howie, I think it's Hugh Howie, Silo Trilogy is really good. It's not it's not young adult, but it has that really immersive, absorbing quality of young adult fiction. And that's a sort of almost like a sort of cross between a post apocalyptic novel and a dystopian novel, particularly as you don't actually know quite what the scenario is at first. It's one of the ones where you have to work out what what happened beforehand. It's got a good mystery element. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah, for all your links. That's OK. Um, I was just trying to find the, the Jesse Lamb one, but um, all my links were to Amazon, for which I do apologise that there are other shops available. Sometimes it's just the easy, easiest way for you to um, find out what it is that we're referring to. It's um, one on my own reading list I haven't actually read yet, but it's meant to be really good. So I've put it in in the chat by Pakistani writer Bina Shah before she sleeps. And that's and that's. I think in the same spirit as The Handmaid's Tale, because it's very focused on women's rights and um, I think environmentalism and also rep reproduction, fertility, controlling fertility. Thank you. Um, so if there are no final questions, um, you've just got a couple of minutes while I'm concluding, if there is something that you wanted to ask Sarah. Um, but I did want to say thank you very much for that, Sarah. That was um, really interesting. And I know that you put that presentation together specifically for English Fest. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Um, and as I said, we have had lots of interest in re um, receiving the recording. So we'll share that out for people to share with. Um, feel free to share it with some of your peers if you think you've got classmates who might be interested in it once we send that through. But we will be 
sending it to everyone who inquired as well and people who booked and then were unable to attend. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much um, for attending also. We would really appreciate your feedback if you could just take a couple of minutes just to complete the form um, with a view to, you know, continuing to run this um, in the future. Equally, if you think there'd be a, a better time of year, um, especially if you're a teacher, for us to run this, um, we'd be happy to consider that as well. Um, but thank you very much for joining English Fest and we will be in touch. Thank you.